Hey. Who are? Do we, are you going to well, introduce someone? Welcome and thank you for joining today's live session. This week's lectures introduce the theory and principles behind crop protection. Today we're thrilled to have Professor Rebecca Nelson of Cornell University and Professor Paul Jepson of Oregon State University here to discuss some specific examples of integrated pest management and looking at the farm fall armyworm. Over you to Rebecca. Great, thank you Lauren. Um, I'm Rebecca Nelson as Lauren mentioned and greetings from Santa Cruz, California where I'm just on a visit. Um, I'll, I'll just uh, briefly uh, introduce myself and uh, and then and then turn it over to, to Professor Jepson to introduce himself. So I'm a professor at Cornell University in the School of Integrative Plant Science, and uh, my laboratory works on disease resistance, particularly in maize native, like natural di genetic diversity for quantitative resistance. Um, and in addition to to that laboratory work, my I have the honor of serving as the scientific director for the McKnight Foundation Collaborative Crop Research Program that funds collaborative research schemes in 12 countries, nine of which are in Africa and three are in the Andes of South America. So in that capacity, I'm familiar with a diversity of pest and disease problems in, in those countries from the projects that people have taken up. Um, and I'll be happy to chat about that. Uh, Paul, over to you. Hey, thank you, Rebecca, and um, good morning, afternoon, or evening, everybody that's on the call. Um, I work at Oregon State University. Um, I started my career in the United Kingdom. I um, have recently been director of a large um, uh, center that works on pest management uh, around the world, uh, but focused in Oregon and the Pacific Northwest and the western part of the United States as our major uh, area of activity. Um, my interests are in um, ecology and cropping systems and I've had got a lot of experience in ecotoxicology and the impact that pesticides have on natural enemies and other organisms. And so I span the kind of risky part of IPM right the way through to the benefits and ecological and uh, more kind of visionary thinking in IPM. Um, uh, but recently, I've stepped down from some of my leadership roles to really try and support uh, this process of responding to fall armyworm in Africa. And during our conversation today, Rebecca and I will have some exchanges about that. But I'm really honored to be on the SDG Canopy uh, session here and uh, looking forward to hearing everyone's questions in a while. Back to you, Rebecca. Yes, I want to also send my greetings and of whatever time of day and to thank you for being on the call as well. And really just want to encourage you to type in your questions. We're going to chat now um, about, you know, some of our other interests, but um, very, very glad to hear what you have to say. Or And when you do type in, feel free at least to say where you are and uh, who you are. Anyway, so um, Paul, let me ask you, how did you get into this um, this area of work? something on your background and what led you here. Yeah. Right, thank you. I actually went to an Earth Day talk when I was at school, a very, very long-haired 17-year-old, and organochlorines <laughs> were in the process of being banned or had been pretty much banned everywhere by then. But the person that came to speak to us, and I've been trying throughout my career to work out who it was again, basically made the point that um, the organophosphate pesticides and broad spectrum insecticides were bringing their own raft of problems and our homework were really in, in agriculture and IPM was just beginning and that really inspired me and that's the thing that triggered my whole career really. But then I did an ecology and zoology and entomology degree at Imperial College and that increasingly excited me about the prospects of working in agricultural systems these artificial systems in a sense that humans have created that just always really fascinated me and then I went to Cambridge University and did a PhD attempting to bring some kind of rationality to management of virus vectors of diseases in, in crops in Eastern England. And really since then my career has kind of expanded to explore um, pest management and ecological opportunities in crops worldwide, uh, West Africa most recently and uh, Central Central America, uh, many European and Mediterranean countries, and the Western United States. So, how about you? Yeah, I think. Yeah, I'm trying to. When I was a graduate student, uh, I had a field station requirement, and I took some of that time to be working in Nicaragua with an ecologist on a corn stunt spiroplasma system, and that got me really yeah. fascinated with um, with that the host plant 
uh, parasite relationship. Uh, I had yep. actually earlier to be a fish pathologist. So I wound up being a plant pathologist. And I, after, after doing a really basic PhD degree in Drosophila genetics and gene interactions, I sort of gene ecology, I, I went on to do a postdoc at the International Rice Research Institute where you could see the effect of the genetic perturbations and the Green Revolution yeah. perturbations that had on the sort of disturbing yeah. what are a rather stable system that you kind of create, yeah. you solve one problem and yeah. you create a raft of other ones. And so, so I got yeah. really interested in the use of um, biodiversity in pest management and sort of right. genetic diversity yeah. at all levels yeah. from, yeah. you know, down to the, the yeah. Yeah. complex genetics through to the ecological and to sort of the way yeah. that you design the ecosystem. And then, so then I moved to, yeah. uh, the Andes worked on potato lape light for some years. So that was a whole nother set of, I mean, very different systems with very different properties. And yeah. now the last few years I've been at, working on maize diseases. And again, with the same sort of principles of, of um, genetic diversity to, yeah. to manage yeah. Yeah. pests. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and we're both looking back on our careers. Uh -huh. And uh, it's interesting that we've kept, it sounds like, some of the things that inspired us right at the beginning and that we've applied those ideas in very different ways and introduced kind of new concepts and approaches as we've gone along. And that's, that's uh, you know, we're, we're rare. We're the kind of survivors in a sense that we, we've, uh, so what, what that does is it builds a lot of kind of knowledge about systems and kind of understanding about the way pest management might operate. So um, I wondered in general what your perspective was on this, uh, this thing we called integrated pest management before we uh, would uh, just, just think of it, just wanted to hear your thoughts about that for a second. Yeah, so I uh, was working as a, you know, lab rat in the Philippines, you know, with a mission to do genetic studies on, on resistance. But I noticed that, you know, there's more to life and like, what was I doing? So you know, at that time, um, you had the FAO doing, um, Peter Kenmore and, and co doing massive farmer field school work. So they were the big rice IPF program and we we're the big rice research yeah. program. And yet they weren't um, chatting yeah. together. As I thought, so I I started working with their program to do farmer field schools for disease because they were really strong on the insect side, and I could yes. bring in ideas on yes. the principles of disease management. And yeah. uh, I think from our pre-chat, I think you and I share the idea that you know you can have all the ideas you want, but if farmers aren't, oh, you know, yeah. aware of not only of the practices that are possible, but also the principles that allow them to yeah. innovate the practices, you know, it's yeah. kind of a difficult situation. Yeah. And yeah. To succeed. So I just loved introducing principles and the yes. farmers away with the principles in their own way much not not yeah. exactly what i might yeah. have thought yeah. it was really exciting and so worked on farmer field schools for some years and now i'm working on farmer research networks with the same kind of a yeah. well, bring farmers and yeah. researchers and extension people together yeah. to sort things out locally yeah but I so I mean, we've, been, <clears throat> we've been inspired by similar things because i um worked in rather theoretical areas and but uh, right at the beginning of my uh, PhD uh, process I was responsible for supporting a plant clinic and had to deal with the problems farmers brought and what you discover is that in IPM and other areas we're asked to work on one pest disease and weed whereas farmers are actually managing 30 or 40 different organisms that operate in different epidemiological systems on their farms so they've got a much bigger problem to solve than the problems we're ever working on. And, um, and so in my earlier work in Africa, I did hear about and get to know about farmer field schools and then later on did participate in those in their early form in Kenya and then worked with the Kenmore group at FAO and was so impressed by the way in which you could scale up some big ideas and some big changes in more ecologically based agriculture. But I perceive well, the, the greatest challenge now is operating at scale, at the scale that really gets the people who are often underserved, who are inadequately served. Even in the Western United States, we get people who do not have the information they need to make the decisions that could progress their system in a way that reduces susceptibility to pest diseases. So starting out as an ecologist, I'm now working very closely with social scientists to try and think about the way systems can adapt to new challenges at scale. And I don't think we've really got that right yet. So I think, but very interesting, we've got similar backgrounds and similar inspirations. So I really, really appreciate that. Yeah, it's really, it is really interesting. So we've talked about, just for a couple of minutes, moving on to um, 
fall army worm because what we want to do is give this uh, group of people that are listening into us a chance to pose questions and we can respond to them is this a good point to kind of move on to this idea of um how we perceive the fall army worm as a kind of a shock a challenge and an opportunity i mean can we just think about that a little bit and and we've had some conversations about this in a kind of glory um they um often have quite a wide host range so that they can survive on non-agricultural flora as well as the agricultural flora and they're opportunists unlike uh, i worked on locusts and grasshoppers in africa many decades ago and they have an ability to kind of isolate and locate places that provide them with a, with a food supply and so this kind of marauding arrival um, rapid destruction of crop and the ability to do a further migratory excursion creates this opportunity for a very big epidemic. And so they're frightening organisms. And um, I guess the way maize had developed in, in Africa very rapidly, um, one could say it was, a, it was something that was waiting to happen in a way. It's an opportunity for this organism that just the two got together and bam. So that's how I'd quickly summarize that. And by the way, in Oregon at the moment, we've had a similar, probably climatic trigger to armyworms for affecting hay and grass and turf crops. And exactly the same attributes are happening, but with different gene genera of, 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 of moth pest. Um, so, so let's, uh, yeah. So back well, just to note. Yeah, let's let's um, let's definitely you know dig into the fall armyworm. But I just want to note Kacho's question here about. Uh, pest management in grain storage. So if we can just set aside a bit of time yeah. for that, I think that would be another excellent okay. subject. Um, Post-harvest yeah. pest being another huge issue and one certainly of great interest to me. Lovely. Okay, have to give us a little while on the fall army woman and we'll be back to your questions. So thank you for, yeah. for posing. Lovely, very glad to help with that. Yes, no, fa uh, really critical issue. Um, so can we, so, okay, so fall armyworm is, is um, one of the big frightening groups. It landed in a place where it's just this perfect storm for it. Um, could you just briefly, I'm going to be interviewing you, Paul, because let's face it, you know a heck of a lot more about this than I do, but um, I'll, I'll be just asking you. <laughs> right. Okay, go. Question one. <laughs> one question is, yeah, so uh, what are the techniques, if any, that have been effective where fall armyworm has been an endemic for a long time. Very often, you know, a pest may be kept in check by its natural enemies back home. But as you mentioned, the fall armyworm has sort of designed a lifestyle that makes it relatively invulnerable. You know, it jumps into the world of the maize plant pretty yeah. early on. And it makes it yeah. hard to uh, yeah. natural enemies to get out of. So what, yeah. what might we learn and what might not we learn from its, you know, home of yeah. you know, yeah. central origin? Um, we've got a narrow kind of genetic diversity of maize in Africa, and there are parts of the world where there's much wider diversity of maize. It may be less productive, uh, they may not be modern hybrids, but there certainly is tolerance, if not complete resistance, to stem borers that have existed uh, historically in in parts of the world where, where where maize was first really developed and adapted where that makes a major contribution i think there's always an intervening factor of field size and the diversity of uh, growing times and the complexity of the system where maize is produced the more complex the system uh, in general uh, most pests insect pests uh, have fewer impacts and um, there's opportunities for the crop to respond. Um, and certainly complexes of parasitoids and hyperparasitoids, that wonderfully complex uh, kind of web of interaction in locations uh, is, uh, certain locations is important. And there's a climatic factor there intervening, where if you don't have immensely long dry periods and you have soils and um, surrounding flora that's conducive to natural enemies, that has a, a suppressive effect. And then um, the other thing to bear in mind is the big picture for fall armyworm, which like many organisms will likely have what we'd call like a recession zone, similar to locusts and some migratory grasshoppers, 
where there are places where they're always going to reside. And in those locations, diseases, climate, natural enemies can be very important and have a big effect on the overall dynamics of the system. And um, the scale of everything in Africa is so utterly vast. If you see a true projection of, of the continent, um, the scaling is absolutely enormous. And the amount of maize that's grown and the way it's distributed is pretty extraordinary. And there's a US Geological Survey map now of, of purports to show every kind of place where agriculture is happening throughout the world. And the level of connectedness of agriculture globally is constantly on the move and expanding. And it creates a contiguous field uh, that organisms that migrate long distances can just really exploit. And so, you know, we've got a, a, a system with different attributes that this pest that can be somewhat managed in other systems where people can tolerate losses, don't forget, uh, better in some systems than it is possible in systems that become completely reliant on one particular crop. So um, that's really a too long an answer. I'm sorry about that. I'll try and make them short. But that's really what's, uh, you know, there are places where it's effectively managed. And... Um, but translating that is a major challenge. It's not an easy thing to do. Wow. Hey, I just want to note a question from Daniela that might be playing to some serious strength of yours, Paul. Is there a chance to develop a detector for pesticides for grocery shops? Um, so you had right. mentioned a bracelet that absorbs pesticide. So I think yeah. let's let's not get too uh, <laughs> long answers. I thought that was a fascinating answer. So thank okay. you for that. Say that one of the things I hear I'm channeling a Paul Jepson to say that one of the real motivating factors, I mean, we hate to see fall army worm chewing up people's crops and you know imperiling their food security. But the other threat is that to to combat that worry, um, the authorities or, or farmers themselves are tempted to to break out the pesticide backpack sprayer and hose the place down with compounds that are have risks of their own. And so Paul was talking about ways of detecting pesticide exposure and then analyzing exposure levels of African farmers and others. So, so then the question of is, you know, then you're sending the bracelet in for chemical analysis, presumably, as I understand it. So yeah. Daniela is asking, you know, are there ways that, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, that might be applicable to um, direct end user, like are there spectral options right. or that sort that might be useful? Really? Good question. I mean, it's true to say that since the 1960s, there have been methods of detecting pesticides. In fact, gas chromatography, this chemical analysis method for, uh, for isolating individual compounds, but using heat in a, in a little tube with sorbative media in it, has been around since the 1960s and actually first used, really, in the Netherlands to work out that uh, turn, Arctic turn chicks were dying as a result of um, eggshell thinning from uh, DDT that was flowing down the, the rivers from where they were synthesized, where organic chlorine pesticides were synthesized. So these methods have actually been around for a long time. We don't lack methods. We lack the capacity as a community to actually use them and deploy them to answer these questions. And we're all responsible for that. It's not all industry. It's not all governance. It's not all the researchers. It's just, why don't we have a system that uh, does uh, answer, uh, ask these questions in a particular way that, that would help us with fall armyworm? Now, now, having said that, which is very important, so we discovered African farmers were exposed to 30 compounds, some of which in, in Senegal, some of which weren't even known to be marketed there. So that's kind of <laughs> shocking to us. However, globally, there is a system of analyzing residues in harvested materials that is pretty active and in general protects the food supply for export commodities. And so globally, there's a very, very large system and there's an organization that's housed at the FAO in Rome called the Codex Alimentarius. And they set limits and then there's like 38, 40 jurisdictions around the world which set limits for the residues that people, consumers are exposed to. But is this like um, HPLC or some high-tech method that you is, have to do? It is, it is, yes. And so um, ultimately, at the end of any uh, sorbative device that picks up the pesticide, you have to have a sophisticated instrument that, that tells you what it is. We don't have something that glows green 
um, that for, uh, for something that doesn't have residues and suddenly shows orange or red if there are residues present. We don't have that type of technology at the moment. But, but Paul, I want to just complain about system. that. There very often there are, in theory, ways of downscaling any high-tech procedure. I mean, I went to the Imperial College London one time and talked to some inventors who were looking for, you know, they said you can take an, an HPLC machine, which is a huge expensive machine that has tremendous versatility and power, and they were looking to reinvent it, you know, the size yeah. of a deck of cards so it can look at one chemical structure. Yeah. So I really yes. feel like one of the engineering challenges for, if there's anyone young and smart on this call, and I, I, yes. hope there, I hope and trust that there are many young, smart people, you know, I would just counsel you to think about being a re-engineer yeah. in the age of yeah. uh, need for yeah. sustainability yeah. and need for serving under, the underserved. I think taking yeah. the idea set that currently applied at high tech to, to buy high, you know, buy, you know, relatively highly resourced societies to protect themselves, those ideas can sometimes be rescaled and refocused. Yeah. I'm yeah. myself obsessed with mycotoxins. Yeah. I, I'm looking yeah. for the, the you know, de-engineered, re-engineered scheme that allows me just to yeah. look at the compound yeah. to know yeah. in the food. And also yeah. sometimes it's like you can use spectral methods once you know exactly what you're looking for yeah. and what yeah. you found. You can yeah, develop light based methods. Method. Yeah, I mean, you know, I could comment a lot further there, but this possibly isn't the, um, you know, the it gets very specialized very quickly. I think what I'd point out was the diversity of chemistry is enormous. Um, we can digest things in our guts that uh, wouldn't be immediately be extractable by a simple device. The extraction methods are complicated, and the concentrations that can actually prove toxic to us in a lifetime of eating maize or a lifetime of eating avocados or plantains, bananas, whatever, um, are so low, we have a challenge of detecting low concentrations. So what I prefer oh, okay. to do is look, at, is look at the alternatives and really push those uh, in a way and provide farmers with the information they need to be able to adopt alternative practices, which means that some of those chemicals that have the chance of having a long-term neurotoxicological or physiological impact in our systems somehow are no longer used because there's a, we have a better way of doing things. And I've yeah, really that's, yeah, that's fair. switched, really, pivoted to really taking that approach. So let me um, say that that brings us to Ivan's question, or Ivan, I don't know. I don't Ivan. Know. Yeah. So, like, what would you suggest? So, you gave us a thrilling list of, you know, field size, uh, genetic resistance, um, you know, planting. I, I've seen that, you know, late planted maize gets hammered much more than that. Yes. Stuff is early. Um, genetic complexity in terms of intercropping, and whatnot. Uh, parasitoids, yeah. or maybe that's landscape yeah. diversity that allows parasitoids, microbial, right. climate. Not all of these things are in the control of farmers. But if you think of those factors that are in the control, of the small heart farmer, his or herself. Uh, what yeah. do you? What can you say about what works and what doesn't? Um, <laughs> I rarely think about what works and what doesn't because if you're it, it, when you know about demography and population dynamics, even a five percent mortality for an organism can have a profound impact on its ability to do harm and to progress epidemiologically. Um, what can small farm, uh, smallholder farmers do? I mean, one thing to remember is that if a large population arrives, lays eggs, and starts, uh, and the larvae start consuming your crop, natural enemies in the vicinity need to respond what we call functionally. So that so they um, they are they natural enemies that can detect those egg masses and actually in the first place and parasitize them. They also need to respond numerically. They go through some kind of population cycles to build up their numbers. And so what we have in many situations where fall army worm initially attacks is a situation where natural enemies may be present, but they're inadequate. And one key thing to do is not to apply a broad spectrum pesticides. And that includes organic pyrethrum as well as synthetic pyrethroids. It includes organophosphate and carbamate pesticides. And in some countries at the moment, those compounds are predominating. And my work, which I'm somewhat renowned for, it shows that you can suppress natural enemies for a whole season if you apply a broad spectrum pesticide early. So one of the things to do is to avoid doing something which is applying a broad spectrum pesticide. If you do apply a broad spectrum pesticide, then you get hooked into that cycle of repeated use. 
And so the opportunity... That's, that's, a, just, that's just a dominant reality of pest management, you know, quite beyond yeah. all our... So, so in other words, then we ask, how do you prepare the crop? And obviously, if a crop is is fertilized, planted, watered, weeded, as, as healthy and vigorous as it can possibly be, uh, there's a degree of tolerance of damage that can occur. And what we, what I know, and my colleague Alan Prusak in uh, Ruska, excuse me, at FAO in Rome, has a deep level of knowledge and experience about um, the degree to which maize can actually respond and still yield significantly with quite hard, large amounts of leaf damage. One thing we've seen in Africa is that the kind of capacity of the maize to actually produce harvestable yield in the first place is grossly affected by the large number of larvae we see. But that doesn't occur in every field. And so one thing we need to do is build knowledge about how often it is we get complete crop destruction and how often it is that we get foliar damage mild populations which can look like shredded coleslaw you know the the, the 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 plant can look very damaged but it actually has a capacity to respond and then certain products like even soaps um, or uh, some of the more selective pesticides if they're made available that are less toxic to natural enemies and also to people um, if they are affordable and available where where damage is high targeting that to the parts of the Field that have the high infestation and allowing natural enemies to uh, pervade and to be effective in the other parts of the field does offer a lot of you know really practical opportunity but just getting that information to somebody who's seeing a new pest for the first time and a crop they completely rely on for their animals and their families suddenly starts disappearing before their eyes there's a natural driver towards the kind of um a simple, you know, solution that. Oh no, it's really. I can see the temptation. Away. Yeah. So, but, but Alan Ruska also told me from his experience in Latin America, I think, as well as some in in, in Africa, that yeah, uh, that sometimes it's been effective to put soil in the whirl of the plant, and then sometimes not. And so his comment was, it turned out that that it's really not the soil per se, although that has some you know potential interest, but it's really the viruses and fungi that live in the soil, which yeah. may be present absent that can lead to yeah. the, the reality of yeah. the larvae so, right. and, and this is known and i think really lovely trick but if you can collect the dead larvae that present yeah, sure. certain symptoms yeah. you know, yeah. they look one way if it's yeah. a virus they look another way if it's a fungus but you collect them and yeah. you basically yeah. use the dead larvae to brew up an yeah. epi, you know yeah. the microbial yeah. cocktail yeah. that yeah. you then sprinkle yeah. on the world of your plants and you get this epidemic um in the field so i so you had expressed um worry that there's you know that these 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 army worms are designed to evade natural enemies but microbial natural enemies could be a interesting difference if you you sort of sprinkle um the the juice of, of the the hemo yeah. and then yeah. we'll, we'll deliver yeah. the yeah. into the world and yeah. then yeah. i'm just wondering how likely that is to kind of kind of bog down the population explosion yeah. so, i mean you know, uh, that one of our problems is, Rebecca, that we've both got very long experience. And um, so I, I think there is an enormous opportunity here. Um, and it may be that social media and our cap capacity actually to get to people now and inform them in a way that did not exist when I was first going to Africa and talking to farmers and extension workers and researchers, that may be a critical catalyst here. I think our ability to get that information out to a large mass is important of people. Yeah, yeah, that's Possibly. why I'm working on this issue even of if, Because I just wanted to make a point here, even if like 10% of farmers in an area are applying broad spectrum pesticides, that's probably enough to suppress populations of natural enemies in the whole village or the whole area. It's this idea of scale, the natural enemies, particular parasitic wasps are moving quite long distances, some of them only short distances, but if you've got a field that's remaining toxic for several weeks because someone's doing repeated sprays and saying great it's working for me i've got protective clothing i'm feeling okay i'm managing my crop well that becomes the place that every natural enemy ultimately visits and so you can end up with a small amount of highly hazardous treatment resulting in a lost opportunity for natural enemies for a large area and so our and challenge is with that competing force but just to answer your question i think we've learned so much about um 
now about this emerging field of uh, insect pathology, not really emerging, it's been really well developed for a very long time and this is where BT, Bacillus thuringiensis came from, nuclear polyhypodrosis viruses, other viruses, um, uh, pathogenic fungi, you know, in the 1980s, Metarhizium and Arsipliae, a uh, fungus disease was being used against grasshoppers in Africa. The problem there was that the local regulatory agencies felt, oh goodness, a disease, how can we regulate this? We don't want diseases brought into our country, this would be a bad thing to do. So there's a whole number of things that need to change, but this idea of um, producing local factories of diseases that could be distributed with no low to no risk to humans, um, I think is fantastic. And so working on that as a localized mechanism to support this, I think that's just what FAO, Pharma Field Schools, the group I work with in USAID, very profound thinkers, really keen to see promulgation, widespread distribution of information to the people that need it. I think there's something really there that could be very exciting. Yes, I agree. Uh, and also, I think it's worth noting that at least the farmer testimonies that I have heard, um, I've heard of some, you know, small scale but systematic attempt to um, test, you know, to try pesticides. And, and one farmer was telling me that as, she's a leader of a farmer organization called Pikwi in Uganda. She said uh, her colleagues who, farmer colleagues who had tried pesticides did not find them effective. They were spraying a tremendous amount to where they claimed that the maize was tasting uh, bitter as a result, but they were not getting good control of the army one. Yeah. So that sounded as hideous well, to me. Right. Well, just uh, it's important to remember that just because you've got something in a bottle that could be effective in perfect conditions uh, against full army worm, translating that into something that's efficacious in the field at the right rate and sprayed in the correct way takes a lot of steps. So I teach farmers how to apply pesticides and I have to remind myself of the arithmetic for calibrating the sprayer every time before I go out because it's quite complicated. And so it's incredibly easy to accidentally apply 10, 15, 20 times the, the, the recommended dose rate because people have a natural tendency to kind of hang around near the plants that are showing symptoms. And so the idea that you walk at this standard pace with a fine spray that is, that is almost invisible when it's landed on the crop, you know, well, why do, if it works that level, why don't I just make it wet? I did this when I was a little kid at home, kind of spraying my dad's vegetable garden, for goodness sake. But what happens is you get to what's called the point of runoff or drip, where most of the pesticide just flows off the leaf like it's raindrops coagulating together on a window pane. And so that whole kind of technological paradigm is very ineffective in an area where this isn't part of the pest management culture. But um, the, the down, of course, when you get locked into that culture, it's hard to step back out of it again. And so I really feel that this uh, way of thinking that broadens our perspective and what can be effective that acknowledges that we don't need absolute efficacy for everything, that we can apply multiple methods that each contribute a small amount to reducing the susceptibility of the crop. That's the, that's the paradigm that we need to provide an uh, education around. And the idea there's no magic solution is a difficult thing to get over because in society and in the way we operate at the moment, magic solutions are always uh, aspired to and hoped for. And there isn't a magic solution here, unfortunately. Yeah, we're having this chat about like simple things like either collecting and crushing or feeding the egg masses. You know, you're, you're sparing yeah. yourself a thousand baby, you know, fall army yes. arms if one egg yes. mass may not be effective. Yes. And then you can once you're in the world, you can crush them with a stick because they're yeah. they're exactly. yeah. leaf sheets and you put a yeah. if you just put yeah. a stick down in there without hurting the maize, you can right. squirt the little baby. Yeah. So well, the what I would say is the farmers I have met in many African countries are incredibly busy and we noticed in West Africa in our large project published in the Philosophical Transactions of Royal Society a few years ago, which is open source by the way, anyone can find that, that um, even the kids of 10, 12 onwards are in the field for four hours a day, six days a week and they're weeding and they're incredibly busy. And I do respect the fact that this is uh, a, di a different form of livelihood to what I have often experienced in the West. And so, um, but given the time resource, um, 
I think it's important to say that collecting egg masses and squashing them and is um, could be incredibly effective. It's the time issue that's pretty critical. But if that can be done, I think what I would like to do is counter some of the arguments that, oh, that's not as effective as this, that, or the other. Because if you are removing, say, 500 egg masses over three days as you're walking through the maze, as you're managing it, you're having an immensely important effect. Perhaps if those, if those pieces of leaf were put into a bucket and just um, left at the side of the field so uh, egg parasitoids could emerge from them, that's even better. So, yeah, um, yeah. as I say, a 5%, 15%, 20% contribution to limiting the population at different times in its life cycle, that's the way to manage things ecologically. It's not yeah. a one-shot get em. It's like, how can we prevent that organism getting to this big fat lava that does most of the damage? And there's multiple things we can do, but we have to respect the fact that many African families spend their whole waking life trying to, to, to ensure yield by the methods that, and approaches they're already using. And so to the idea that you can suddenly add 15, 20 hours a week of doing something like that may be impractical in some situations. No, I think that's a really important uh, point. So that's why I think it's important to work directly with, I think we share the opinion that work directly with communities to find what actually works for them with that labor consideration as part of the picture. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, also farmers can innovate. There, there, there's a lot of talk about feeding yes. natural enemies um, and, yes. and different things. That, right. So if farmers are aware of the full array of principles and practices that have worked, then, you know, they can figure out what combination is effective for them. They yeah. may have, yeah. they may have like in fields that are really more important yeah. for their security yeah. and outfields, which yeah. they're just yeah. dedicate to other crops and you know, put yeah. the pigeons there yeah. and, but spend some time with the maize crop that's actually going to be most important for their yes. security potential. Well, I mean, you know, what, it's a fascinating. I love this discussion. And I, I think one thing to reflect on to everybody is that uh, you and I are really clear on the underlying concepts, the ecological problem, the demography, the way the organism arrives um, in a kind of a shock process of large numbers of eggs being laid, but two weeks later you can get just the same thing happening. And then local populations build up and the same can happen again. And then there's a slightly later planted crop and so the insects from the crop you just planted move across. To somebody whose experience is a very profound and successful and sustainable presumably a, let's say, approach to, to managing that crop, to have this new thing arrive and to not have that conceptual foundation, even though conceptually as a farmer, they're far better than I would ever be and could ever be at producing a crop. To, what we're implying by this is that the farmer is somehow going to be monitoring what's going on and they'll have some quantitative picture of how the pest is distributed. And um, that's the time for that and the way in which that could then get factored into the way somebody is thinking. Um, we have, it's not that people aren't, don't have immense capacity for learning. It's just that this is almost like the scientist's perspective on what a farmer could think <laughs> in order to manage their crop effectively. And um, I've learned long and hard that, um, you know, I ended up doing an education program in Oregon on record keeping, how to keep a record of what you did historically to help you understand what the future might enable you to do. And the thing, my trigger for that was going to a farm, an organic farm in Japan where this man had a scroll of paper that actually went back 150 years. Oh, my Lord. And he said, oh, we tried that. We tried that then. This didn't work. Then we decided to put next to the end plant, we put some maize. Then we discovered that that pest over five years never occurred in the eggplant any longer, the aubergine. And so that type of record keeping and collective knowledge is part of IPM. And in many parts of the world, people are running constantly to keep up with that moment of management that captures the future opportunity for managing the crop. That's where their conceptual frame is. They're not looking back and thinking historically. And I know if I had a maize farm in Africa, I would be just the same. I wouldn't, I would suddenly get into that other mode of thinking, which is, oh my goodness, this new thing's arrived. It looks catastrophic. It's removing that future opportunity. What can I do about it? So what no, we need to- it, Yeah, you have to understand that. Yeah. That's psychic. Anyway, but I, where, where are we going? So, so Ivan has, uh, I don't know if this is one of Ivan one or Ivan two, or is this Ivan three, but 
uh, he is asking about this application of ash and chili powder into the world um, as a stem borer remedy. And so maybe this is a chance to look at that issue of powders and compounds because yes. I, it comes back to a prior question about post harvest management as well. Because I have observed that in poor, poor African traditional management of post harvest, and then some of the experiments that have been conducted by researchers, researchers working in Uganda through the McKnight program, um, they're exploring different, very fine powders, and they have. You know, they, I mean, in the case of chili powder, I, I presume that there's a chemistry there that's, that's irritating or, or toxic to the, to the uh, organism. But some of the just e even inert powders can be, can have a negative effect on the insect through yes. the the breathing apparatus and also through, you know, yes. force, they spend time cleaning yes. themselves but, or else it's choking yes. them. And so I've heard yes. that yes. diatomaceous earth can be effective, although it was not effective for the fall armyworm, according to the uh, FIPS program, people that, have tried it. Right. So, um, so brick dust right. and animal dung yes. and yes. different ashes have been effective yeah. in post harvest yeah. management. So because through right. that right. blocking and irritating process just that yeah. those yeah. powders can have. Yeah. Well, I think partly um, first challenge is when the larvae are inside the whirl of the maize plant, they, pour, they form a cap of frost, their excretory products, above that, and that prevents access to anything, pesticides, whatever. So, I mean, um, that's number one problem, is to get these materials down to the insect. Um, many earths are uh, formed from uh, diatoms and other tiny creatures uh, with uh, spicules on them that can be in toxic on the little membranes that lie between the parts of the external skeleton of the insect. Remember, insects are crunchy rather than chewy. And so we've, <laughs> we've got these intersegmental membranes, they're called, where these diatomaceous earths are absolutely can cause wriggling and writhing, prevent the insect feeding, it can start. Glassy little diatom yeah. shells are irritating um, that. And some earths also are highly alkaline or highly acidic, so you get a pH contribution there. Um, but um, it's often the art of application is as important as the um, irritability, toxicity, hazard of the material itself. Um, and if you've got a place that, where there's heavy dew every morning, if you have a um, uh, frequent rains um, or you know, there's all sorts of factors that could reduce the efficacy of such a thing. But if there was a way of getting reasonably, uh, then diatomation reserves and other things, there's no reason at all why they um, are effective. I have to ask this question myself, what the consequence for I think, be, because uh, these things can be equally harmful to any insect. But uh, I can certainly say a lot less toxic, a lot less persistent, and a lot less hazardous than many of the broad spectrum pesticides. So, you know, that's it. That, but thank you. That's really interesting. And so I, Ivan Landers, I don't really don't know about chili powder, but there are certainly, I know, organic farmers in the Western United States use a variety of natural product extracts that can be really, really good if they're high quality and efficacious and uh, they've been made um, in a way that ensures that they're going to work. Well, this is all very intriguing, but yeah. um, any comment on this issue of protecting the ear in particular? Oh, by the time you've got to an infestation that could have uh, harmed the uh, ear, uh, it's very, very difficult to imagine effective ways of, of managing that organism kind of in, in the crop itself. Um, and uh, unfortunately, um, there does seem to be some pervasive uh, ear damage um, that can occur. And they, then the mycotoxin risks from that, which you know about, Rebecca, uh, can have a far more profound and disturbing impact uh, as presuming that you get to the stage of having harvestable yield. And so uh, knowing about that, understanding the distribution and level of the, uh, the um, contamination that leads to mycotoxin exposure is, is really horrible. So early management's important. I have to say we're in a window at the moment of 
two, three, four years where modern but conventionally based breeding mechanisms are moving towards, if you like, two thirds, three quarters level capacity to tolerate fall armyworm damage and to uh, not, and so it's a certain level of resistance. And the USAID fall armyworm manual has a chapter by uh, Prasanna Bodupali in there that talks about this wonderful opportunities out there. And on a kind of a nine point scale, I believe something like that for assessing damage at the end of the year, uh, you can really, uh, really make progress with some of the lines that are out there. So what we're looking at is management currently for varieties that are highly susceptible, high capacity for damage and high capacity, unfortunately, for mycotoxins to be passed on. And um, I don't know what you would say about managing and dealing with that risk, but in the in the medium term, like two to three years from now, if if the if these um, modern varieties, uh, but um, conventionally bred varieties, can be kind of produced in sufficient amount, I do believe this will be less of an issue. But at the yeah, moment, this idea. Yeah, sorry, carry on. So this is an awkward question because I think it's it's a, a, a very um, controversial topic. Yeah, well, uh, but, so, but what the, you so I'm thinking of BT in the form of dipo yes. or just uh, the the ah. pesticidal uh, format, and yes. also in the form of um, yes, okay, uh, it's genic because because there there has been a recent meta analysis saying that generally BT can be used to reduce mycotoxin exposure, obviously in places where you have insects that are bringing the mycotoxins in. I'm curious about that. Yeah. I, yeah. I I've heard of studies going right. on with use of the, the, the sort of ordinary yeah. granular yeah. Um, yeah. format yeah. as well. Right. I don't know the story yet. I can make a couple of comments there that might be of interest to the audience. Uh, one is that BT isn't registered in every African country, and that's for many, many reasons, because it's an incredibly effective insecticide uh, uh, that poses low to no risk to applicators and works incredibly well against butterfly and moth larvae. Um, resistance can build up in certain locations with, with certain pests, and that's worth noting. Um, many of the, remember this form armyworm arrived already with a complement of inbuilt resistance because it's a, it's a population of organisms that we think came from the east, uh, southeastern United States where overuse of pesticides has led to a large amount of resistance. So it turns out that things like BT are far more effective already, we are pretty certain, than many of the conventional pesticides, which people would assume offer kind of an instant ready-built solution in a bottle. And so, um, you know, BT already has tremendous opportunity if it can be registered in certain countries and deployed in a way that doesn't instantly cause overuse and resistance. When it comes to some of the GM varieties, again, the chapter in the USAID Fall Armyworm Manual deals with this in a, in a sensitive and respectful way. It's certainly the case that some of the existing uh, genetically modified uh, varieties of maize offer almost complete resistance. And um, I think in South Africa, that's, uh, that's probably the major um, uh, management method they use and fall armyworm therefore in many places I understand is not a problem um, however um, and there are certain countries where this is being evaluated in Africa and if you were to purely take out all the politics concern our concerns about risk for something that's inbuilt in the plant for the whole season versus something you apply for a narrow window of time all of those issues if we we're to take that away for a moment then as scientists, you and I might say, well, how would you use something like this? Would it be good to say do uh, three rows on the border of every crop and then you plant your favorite maize in the middle? Should we have one field out of every 10 that's this, you know, that, so that the, so we get area-wide suppression because we're using this thing in a surgical way to reduce the, the severity of the outbreak. Are there some parts of say Malawi or Ethiopia or Ghana or other countries that are affected where the populations are so hot, we're going to use those varieties there and suppress the opportunity for a countrywide outbreak, but then rely on other methods in other parts of the country. So, I mean, there are ways you could think about using such a technology, but the sensitivities are so great that at the moment, uh, what we're looking at is this um, uh, using it where it can be used in a way where trust has built up and people 
kind of have some understanding of how to deploy it. Um, but in other countries, we're in this, in this period of uh, waiting until more conventionally bred materials are available. And so that's yeah, really so that where we are. Yeah, so that period has been so long now that I think we have to acknowledge. So, and I just want to, I want to wedge it, but I think we need to address Kacha's post, post-harvest grain storage question. But I also just yes, want to okay. say that um, it, there's some evidence, at least that's been published, I don't know how much it's been repeated in the field, that the push-pull system, so you had mentioned surrounding your cornfield yeah, with yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, right. tea maize, yes. but yes. I think you can also yes. apparently, you know, surround it with, you know, breast yes. Or whatever other sort of preferred sort of a host, so that yes. so that's at least a possibility of using you know barrier yes. crops. Um, yes. But I think um, so. Speaking of bear kacha, to Kacha's point, we're just kind of touching on the possibility of using non-preferred or possibly pesticidal plants around a maize field, and yeah. that issue of barrier is also one of the issues in grain storage, right? So whether you're before or after harvest. Yes have a number of different principles that you can apply. So bear, yes. an effective barrier is one that you can use before or after harvest, but you have additional tricks you can use in grain storage. And I think the number one effective one that people have been drawing upon recently is the principle of depriving your pest of oxygen, which is very difficult to practice in a cornfield, but can be pr practiced in a triple bag, for example. So, you know, I don't know, yes. the principles that I think of in storage include um, put up a good barrier, you know, suck the oxygen out of the either. So if you've got a metal uh, tank that you have your um, your grain in, or if it's a plastic bag, it, if you can make that airtight, then you can either burn out the oxygen with a little candle in there, or you can just let that the pests absorb the oxygen, and then, uh, or you can use other oxygen absorbing technology. Drying your grain really well and absorbing the oxygen and moisture out of it will make it store better. I do want, and then then there you can put repellent, but the same botanical um, products, yes. like tephrosia yeah. or other repellent crops, can be used in the field and they can be used in store. So there, right. and then and these dusts can be used. Um, we're mentioning diatomaceous earth. Yeah. So then many different locally available dusts can be yeah. irritated and also just block. Yeah. You know, you can kind of essentially put a barrier between your crop, yeah. right. you know, your grain, and your yeah. pest. And yeah. then there's one yeah. other uh, thing. Um, yeah, I don't know if you could put BT in there and have a better, right? You know, range of, I mean, sort of a, you know, cost benefit. Um, but there's yeah. one thing I just want to touch on. It comes back to Paul's comments about the genetic properties of the grain itself, and that is that traditional African mazes are of the flinty, um, dense, sort of vitreous, glassy grain and the sperm type, and those are inherently more resistant to, to insects and to yes. pests. And also, I must say, to mycotoxigenic fungi. And so no. I think we also, as we're looking at, you know, what about the maize vulnerability question, the big, fluffy, high-yielding maize varieties um, are inherently, I have genetic evidence that I think is fairly serious at this point that there's an element of vulnerability that comes in when you're growing these big, fluffy um, hybrid maize corn types. And so I think we have to really reassess both for pre-harvest and post-harvest insects yes. vulnerability and also mycotoxin vulnerability. Yeah. We really might have to look back and, yeah. and reinvest yeah. in the tougher, more vitreous flint type mazes if right. we want something really that can important. be in before right. and after right. insect yeah. and mycotoxin attack. I think, I think in general, globally, including in the United States and Europe, um, that we've underestimated the importance of taking a complete crop reduction view from the whole cycle of, of the crop. And post-harvest in particular has had insufficient attention. And so we've had some dramatic advances with some projects funded by the Gates Foundation, other foundations recently kind of um, uh, distributing knowledge about systems that farmers had already developed in some places and were just simply not being adopted elsewhere because they were isolated from each other. And nearly always those have at present been kind of engineering solutions of forming a more complete barrier um, there are BTs uh, that are toxic to beetles, uh, weevils, and other organisms that affect stored grain. The BTs that are used in uh, foliar sprays in, uh, against Lepidoptera, you don't tend to get uh, moths and butterflies being pests of stored grain. So it's a, it's a different BT, and I don't know how really to think about that. 
Um, well, there's lots uh, of different endotoxins that can be screened, I suppose. So. Yes, yes. So, but what the point you make about repellents and other materials, again, all of those things contribute to effective protection. And I think the issue is sometimes a small resource issue of how people obtain the types of plastics or containers that can completely enclose. Um, and then, then the next problem is really uh, knowledge that uh, you can you can actually be almost completely preventative with often a, a simple solution. And um, the degree to which people are informed and have access to information, we mustn't underestimate how powerful a driver of problems this is. Because I see that here in Oregon, where everybody has a computer, everybody has a fancy smartphone. And yet, even in those situations, and everyone had access to extension workers, and they get um, a license to spray, and they have to show they can do it effectively, we still have many of the similar problems, although not as widespread, to the ones that we're talking about in Africa today. So I do not want to imply in any of this conversation that we've got it right here somehow, and we're going to just basically explain how to get it right in Africa, because it, it, we haven't actually got it right here. Pest management is evolving, and that paradigm, oh, sorry, that, that kind of, I didn't mean to say it that way, but that way that people think about solving today's problem and then just kind of dealing with things like the fire brigade every, every day, that, that's just a critical driver of the way people operate. So thinking more broadly about the complete production cycle might cause us to think differently about those maize varieties that you're describing for army worm. I think that's really important. It maybe it is being considered, but I think it's a very important factor to think about what the what condition the grain is it with the maize is in when it's harvested and how to protect that and minimize mycotoxin um, uh, growth and um, exposure. But I think when you're talking about that whole crop cycle, Paul, I think it brings us back to an initial point that we had made, which is that really investing in farmers and communities and their access to the social capital that gives them access to the technical capital that, that allows yeah. them to creatively co-design yes. the system to their Absolutely. pest problems. Yeah. I think you and I concur that that can be underrated. Like if you're part of, an, of yes. a of a farmer research organization yes. that gives yes. you both social gives you social access if there's any crisis you have friends and you have you have um co you have partners that you can tap into yes i think the potential is to is to have a, yes. a co-creative social capital yeah. in, in the in the community that can help people yes. confront what the problem is and the minute solution they can share that and they get access yes. to a little bit of information something yeah. works they can distribute that amongst a, yeah. a network. So yeah. I think that investing yeah. in people and in their networks yes. and in the yes. ecological yeah. capital that can be, that can be yes. shared, that's going right. to be more, like, it's costly in the moment, but it, it's a sustainable yeah. infrastructure yes. that allows people to but, solve problems. Yeah. The next problem. Yeah, having a policymaker visit as well and having a, a, a an elected representative and a village uh, elder and the mayor and um, having understanding that that a solution farmers come up with can have impact on a national scale if sufficient farmers recognize they've developed a method of being effective i mean it's really um we underestimate the importance to have change occurring at every level of the system and i don't want to leave out the people up at the presumed top there that have the role in setting policies and if, and uh, passing laws that encourage these good things we're talking about and possibly discourage the bad things we're talking about. I think operating with farmers and building on that social capital, but also having it recognized and formally in the way we do things. I think those two parts are very important. Hey, Rebecca, are we running out of time? I think we're actually out of time. We just got a... Um got a message so i would really like to thank i think professor paul jepson we're very extremely fortunate to have such as someone with such deep knowledge of the particular problem that we've sort of featured today the fall army worm yeah. which is very worthy of being featured but also just generally having such deep knowledge of pest management i really okay. appreciate having you um on this this morning or afternoon or evening paul well, thanks very much and thanks for lauren for setting us up she's in stockholm you know and um oh. That's, that's nice that she's taken time to keep see us through. And I want to really thank everybody who's been on the line, and particularly those yeah. people that typed in some really amazing and uh, yeah. interesting things there. 
So thank you very much for the opportunity. I really enjoyed it. And uh, Lauren and Rebecca, um, you know, and to everybody that's listening, uh, this is a problem that we all we can all make a contribution towards the eventual solution for. So thank you very much.